So I'm going to be talking today about cognitive behavioral therapy in psychosis. <coughs> Just a disclosure slide. Now, there are developments occurring all over the world in this field. Um, I will just mention the work that I'm doing in Rome at La Sapienza with Massimo and Roberto. And th this project is about training inpatient psychiatric nurses to use CBT with acute severe schizophrenia. So today I'm going to attempt to cover some different areas. I'm going to talk about which types of schizophrenia do best with CBT. I'm going to talk about the basic techniques which psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses can use in their everyday clinical practice. I'm then going to talk about new advances and a bit about the research developments. I'm then going to talk about the interface with psychodynamic therapy and remediation and psychoeducation. And I'll finish off with a bit about the use of functional MRI and showing how that can predict a response to CBT for schizophrenia. Is my language okay? Okay. Good, thank you. So, in the CBT research community, we prefer Bloiler to Cripolin. And I think a broiler against cripolin is a bit like Roma against Lazio. It's a bit of a battle there as to, to which, is, which is better. But certainly in our experience, we see different types of schizophrenia. We see people with very severe cognitive deficits, and we see other people with no cognitive deficits at all. <coughs> we see people with severe hallucinations and other people with no hallucinations. We see clinically different schizophrenias. So myself and David Kingdon went through our entire caseload and we thought we had described the main types of schizophrenia. We called one of them sensitivity disorder because there was extreme sensitivity to stress. This seemed to be a very biological schizophrenia, one that Kripalin might have recognized. We saw a group of schizophrenias that seemed to be caused or triggered by strong cannabis, LSD, cocaine, and amphetamine. And we called that drug-induced psychosis. And then we saw the catatonias, but they have almost all disappeared in Newcastle. Where are they? Are, are they all in Italy? Do you have a lot of catatonia? The schizophrenias are changing over time. And I think that is very interesting. Then we saw a big group of patients who fell into a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but in actual fact, they looked a bit borderline. And, and this group had a heavy load of trauma in their childhood as a vulnerability factor, and then trauma which triggered this schizophrenia. Now we saw that as being a very big group. And then we saw a group which we called anxiety psychosis. And this was 
that the hallmark of the very big delusional system. Now, looking at this group, it looks like it's the bottom two which respond best to the psychotherapies because they are more psychogenic. The top ones are more biological. So this is the traumatic psychosis group which we see, and I'm sure you will recognize them from your own practice. Their key characteristics are of multiple auditory hallucinations. And it's interesting that the more trauma they have had, the more voices they will hear. The voices are usually critical and commanding. But they also have visual hallucinations. They see distortions of their trauma, distorted as in a dream. So it's not like a true flashback. And they have somatic hallucinations, often of sexual interference. I sometimes wonder how we miss the trauma in these cases. Very often they have instability of mood and often the medicines just don't work well for them. So these patients often are on mood stabilizers, multiple antipsychotics, antidepressants, with minimal benefit, but this is a group that does do well with CBT and other psychotherapies. So it seems important what the psychiatrist's view is of this illness of schizophrenia. We think some of the schizophrenias are much more treatable than others. So what about medicines then? Well, the antipsychotics are a great advance. And the number needed to treat is four. So if you have four people with schizophrenia, one of them will have an excellent clinical response to an antipsychotic. But this means three out of four will not get that response. The response will be at placebo level, or they will get no response. Now this fits in with our first talk by hands about concordance, because often our patients won't take them because they just aren't working for them. But it seems to us that the sensitivity disorder and drug-induced psychoses should be the ones that respond to dopamine blockade. It is clear also that you can predict the response to antipsychotic medicine. And early response is a powerful predictor of eventual good response. So it seems that within the first couple of weeks on an antipsychotic, you're going to have a very good idea as to whether this medicine will work or whether they're going to be in a group with poor response and they might need CBT or family therapy, clozapine or some other treatment. It's interesting that there are certain symptoms in schizophrenia which really don't do well with medicine. Now, command hallucinations are typical. They really don't do well with dopamine blockade. Big delusional systems, even with clozapine, usually only get a degree of response, but they're still there. Now, we'd mentioned that the command hallucinations are very typical of traumatic psychosis. So what are the basic techniques which we can all use in our clinical practice? Now, I started doing this work in 1991, 
I know you're all saying he's not old enough. That can't be true. But I did start in 1991, and what the patient seemed to like best was the normalising explanation. Now, this was not to minimise the severity of symptoms. We were saying, I know you're hearing these horrible voices, but voice hearing is actually very common in society. And Jim Van Ossie's research has disclosed that about 8% of people will have an episode of voice hearing. Most voice hearing recovers. Patients loved to hear that because it was destigmatizing and it was hopeful. So this is one of the main techniques we'll be using in the clinics to normalize voices and paranoia. So what will make any of us hallucinate? Well, lack of sleep. If this lecture was to last all weekend, by the end of it all, some of you would be hallucinating. Bereavement. Very often hallucinations happen when someone close has died. When trauma hasn't been disclosed, there is often hallucination. And of course, hallucinogenic drugs could make anybody hallucinate. The human brain very easily hallucinates. This is a powerful message for people with schizophrenia. So here's a typical model of how this works. There is a trigger factor, and there is then the hearing of a voice. We then have, a, this is the key point, a misinterpretation of what that voice is. And that might cause anxiety and the emergence of safety behaviours. Now, what is a catastrophic appraisal? Now, if any of us started to hear a voice, we would probably put it down to stress or lack of sleep. But our patients are thinking, this is aliens, or this is a demon, or a ghost. They are thinking something extremely frightening. Now, this is, of course, a secondary delusion. But what happens to this cycle here is the same up to this point. But here we have the interpretation. And they get very, very anxious. And they don't sleep well. They stay awake at night waiting for the aliens. This makes everything worse. And then they put silver paper on the window to keep the aliens out. And this causes problems. And they start searching for UFOs in the area. So there is a route into schizophrenia through the explanation of the core symptom. Now, we do this diagram with all of our patients because it shows so many different ways that you can tackle the voice hearing. The next issue is coping. How good are our patients at developing coping strategies for voices? The answer is they are terrible at developing coping strategies. We did a survey of over 300 patients at a hearing voices group, and we asked them how they coped. Now, the vast majority were using inappropriate distraction. Loud music was the commonest one. It just doesn't work. So they start to do something which makes their symptoms worse. 
They need to be moving to focusing and using techniques like sub-vocalization. For example, reading aloud, reading from a book, will often help if you keep your eye on what the voice is doing. Metacognitive techniques like mindfulness are the peak of coping skills. Now, I was sure that my nurses must have been teaching the patients to cope. And they said, no, we don't do it. It's the psychologists that do that. So I asked the psychologists, and they said, no, we don't do it. It's the nurses that do that. Nobody in our service was teaching people how to cope. This is amazing, isn't it? And it is so easy to do. Roberto believed that a satellite was taking thoughts out of his mind and broadcasting them. He believed that people in the street could hear his horrible thoughts. This is a common symptom of schizophrenia. He was very distressed and he would not leave his house. So he wasn't testing them out. So there is the satellite. How could we test this out with them? How could we help them work with this delusion? Well, he needs to think about if he is thinking certain thoughts, how will people react outside? Could we watch for different reactions if he changed his thoughts? So Roberto starts to think, the new pope has just been appointed and he is visiting the street outside my home. You would see a reaction in the people out in the street. And he looks for this and he doesn't see that reaction. So we can help Roberto challenge and work with the delusion. Now this does cause anxiety for people, but these kind of delusions are very amenable to cognitive behavioral therapy. Negative symptoms are also a good target. And we often find that high levels of anxiety, sadness, and shame are preventing improvement with negative symptoms. There is the issue of cognitive confidence. There was a book called The Broken Brain. Now, people with schizophrenia often believe the brain is broken and they cannot be expected to achieve things. But what Tim Beck and his colleagues discovered and they published in the archives of psychiatry that last year was that helping people to make very small achievements allowed them to overcome this belief that the brain was broken. And as they did so, their negative symptoms could improve. And so voices, some delusions, and negative symptoms are good targets for CBT. But there are side effects. We mustn't forget it. When we ask Roberto to test out his delusion, he will become more anxious. He has to because he is now looking at the world outside himself. Very often when we're working with people with schizophrenia, they will decide to disclose some very painful trauma and that will cause emotional distress. If we ask too many questions of someone with a big delusion, very often they will retreat into the delusion and they won't come back for appointments. 
So we've got to be careful about the pace of the questions. We can't give them too much homework or that worsens their cognitive confidence. It is very clear that sometimes recovery of insight also leads to increased depression. So as with antipsychotic medication, with CBT, we need to be careful about side effects. Now this is a trial of uh, 20 sessions of CBT as against 20 sessions of befriending as done by an expert therapist. And what we see is a, a very good result for the CBT and the befriending did really well. So this was very upsetting for us. But there was something interesting about befriending. It was actually quite good for severe persecutory paranoia. The more paranoid the person was, the better the befriending was. Befriending was hopeless for voices and negative symptoms. So the different types of therapy have different targets and different benefits. So any important recent randomized trials? Well, what we have seen is that cognitive behavioral therapy is the best researched, but the other therapies are all quite good, basically. They all have their place. In this trial by Barrowclough, which was about cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing for people with drug dependence and schizophrenia, there was a negative result. It seems that when you work with somebody with schizophrenia and a drug problem, you don't go for the drug problem first. You go for the schizophrenia first, and then you might get some benefits on the drug use. In the bottom trial here is about metacognitive therapy, and it's talking just about the worry linked to paranoia. So if you just tackle worry, what happens to paranoia? Now the result of this very brief therapy was that there were quite definite benefits by working with worry. Here we have another result, Klingberg negative symptoms, a good result with CBT and a good result with cognitive remediation. A very big trial, very well run, both treatments had definite effects. What do the meta-analyses say? Well, what they're coming round to saying is that as we do more research, CBT in schizophrenia is modestly more superior than the other therapies. Uh, the, the other therapies are good, though. The end result of all of this is that people with schizophrenia need to talk. Here is an effectiveness trial, and this was teaching psychiatric nurses in the community to do CBT. So we have 422 patients, and 257 got CBT from the nurses, and the vast bulk of them remained in the trial. So what were the results with the nurses? Well, they were successful in improving overall symptoms and insight and depression, which was good. But 12 months later, the main effect was in negative symptoms. We had lost the result in depression because of improved insight. 
Now, it is clear that CBT partly works through improving adherence. And it partly works because of improved coping and working with symptoms of schizophrenia. <clears throat> At the end of two years, there was improved hospitalisation and a delay to relapse in the CBT group. So we should train our community nurses to do brief CBT with schizophrenia. I must say the nurses greatly enjoyed a brief training. Only took 10 days, but they did have to be supervised. Now here's something interesting. With brief CBT for schizophrenia, there was a huge gender result. Women with schizophrenia do much better with brief CBT. I wonder why that might be. It's interesting. It seems that women simply can engage more quickly and are quicker to report their painful emotions. Now, we tried to train case managers in brief CBT in Ohio, and these were people with no mental health qualification. So could they do as well as the nurses? They used some very simple techniques. The results weren't as good as the nurses, but they weren't dangerous. They did get some benefits using these CBT techniques. So in an ideal world, you might have a whole team trained in these same techniques and these formulations. OK, so what about psychodynamic psychotherapy? Where does that fit with CBT? What if this psychosis all comes from the unconscious? And you can see here the idea of a volcano with the unconscious material coming out of the volcano and hardening outside as lava. Now, what we would argue here is that you can do psychodynamic therapy, but CBT should be used first to deal with the symptoms that appear outside the mind, like voices, and paranoid delusions. Use CBT for those symptoms and then use the psychodynamic formulation. That is how we would think it might be best to be used. This is a functional MRI and it's being used with patients with very severe hallucinations. And th this first one is baseline. And what they do is an actor reads out their voices to them while they're in the fMRI. So they're hearing their voices, and this makes the brain light up in certain ways. This is after 20 sessions of CBT, and we see a very marked reduction. Something has happened in brain functioning. Now, this big reduction is occurring at the level of the insula and the temporal cortex. So it was a bit like the last speaker talking about top down and bottom up. This is evidence that CBT works top down. But here's another one. There's only 4% reduction between baseline and after 20 sessions. The CBT just didn't work. What is going on here? Well, the first one is a traumatic psychosis, and it has a different pattern on the fMRI. So perhaps we can predict which patients might respond best to CBT.
What about patients who completely refuse antipsychotics? Now, if you think about it, this is the majority of people with schizophrenia. We know that half of all people with schizophrenia won't come near our services anyway because of stigma and lack of insight. And we've heard about the compliance problems. Lots of people just refuse the medicine. So if you offer them a psychotherapy instead of a medicine, what will happen? Well, what you see here is that the majority, actually 26 were offered it and 20 accepted CBT. So if people with schizophrenia refuse medicine, they might accept a therapy because that's something that they believe in. That's not to say it's going to work, work for them. But here's the results of that trial, 20 sessions of CBT, baseline, end of therapy, follow up. So there is a benefit to using the CBT. And interestingly, delusions without medicine, the CBT actually did better. And that takes a bit of explaining. There's the voices, not quite such a good result, but still a result. Did we, were we able to get people to start medicine using CBT? Well, the numbers were small. We only got three out of the 20 to, well, it's something, isn't it? It's only about 15 or 20 percent, but it's something. So, what are the new directions in CBT to summarize this? Well, it would be good to do manuals which look at the different schizophrenias. The techniques are slightly different between a big delusion and somebody with a trauma psychosis. We need pragmatic trials of what works. We want head-to-head -head trials of CBT against psychodynamic as against psychoeducation. We want lots more neuroimaging. We want to combine remediation and CBT and do predictor analyses. We have almost no research in adolescents and children with psychosis. We desperately need to do this. Should they receive medication, CBT, or a mixture? What about low intensity versus high intensity? For some people, low intensity works very well. Then there are techniques arising from mindfulness and compassion-based therapy. CBT then is modestly superior at the current time to the other therapies, but it does have a strong evidence base. CBT is less good for primary negative symptoms, cognitive deficits, and big delusions, but it is good for voices, secondary delusions, and secondary negative symptoms. CBT works well along with psychoeducation, family therapy, and other interventions. It might work even without medicine for some people. And we need to train our nurses for definite, but maybe our case managers, and I think also our psychiatrists, as we all have a role. There's an Italian version of this book, which is the simplest discussion about CBT. And if you put my name into any of these engines, you will find the YouTube clips and information about training. Thanks very much.